In the food business, there's tremendous amount of misinformation. I mean, if you want to feed your family healthy food, you got to ask a lot of questions. Well, we seem to feel uh, free to regard wilderness as sacred and agricultural land as profane. And that is a disconnect. Because what we're doing is we're, we're taking the nutrients from this soil, and we're shipping it far away, and it's not going to come back. You know, one of the downsides of the faster, cheaper model is that oftentimes you just can't afford to do everything as right as you should. There is a shift. I, I look at it as a view to kind of reinvent food. I've always believed that we need a revolution in society. Revolutions start from the bottom. They never start from the top. The bottom are these little small farmers and fishermen, and they're committed to the same things we are, which is doing something different. People who are willing to break the paradigm. I've always thought of, you know, my company, uh, Patagonia Clothing Company, as an experiment. Making decisions based on quality and responsibility. And I can tell you that it's not an experiment anymore. I've proven to myself it works. Now, applying that to food is another story. This is another experiment. But I think it's the most important experiment we've ever tried. Grains represent some 70% of our calories, grown on about 70% of our acreage worldwide. Our crops that we currently grow for grain are all annual plants. An annual plant is one you have to plant it every single year. And that process involves disturbing the ground, creating a space for that seed. That plant comes up, you harvest it, it dies. And then there has to be a period of resetting the stage, preparing to, to plant again. Pretty soon we have degradation of soil happening as a rule when we start growing um, annual grain crops. Every time you grow cotton or corn or whatever, you're losing topsoil. And you can't do that forever. Regenerative agriculture actually builds topsoil. Wes is doing the most important thing in agriculture in 10,000 years. Soil is more important than oil and as much of a non-renewable resource as oil. The rate of soil development and this, this sort of thing, it's, it's, it's a very slow process, I can tell you that. The soil of the Midwest took thousands of years to develop. I was hired at the Land Institute in 2001 primarily to work on what we called perennial wheat. This was a program where we're crossing wheat with a perennial grass. We have perennial plants that we eat that are apples, pears, nuts. Um, but when it comes to them, something that is the staple of the human diet on large scales, um, we don't have any options. So we're trying to bring the perenniality of the perennial grass with the features of wheat that we like. Big seed, stuff we can make bread out of, of good yield. And we're trying to bring those two things together from different species. That's a very complicated, challenging task, and we're still working on that here. We have a lot of different experiments here with the intermediate wheat grass, or kerns as we call it. Um, but this is like the, the heart of the breeding program where we put out huge numbers of plants. So plant breeding is sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. You're looking for that thing that combines the traits that you really want. I think every one of us working here believes that we're in this project to make a real change. By having a large, massive root system that goes very deep into the soil, we're bringing carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis, pumped down into the root system. If you have perennial mixes out there staying in the ground, the carbon that gets captured can then stay there. It's a way to recarbonize the soils. Kernza is sort of the first one uh, out and there's still a lot of work to do on it. 
When I first published on this, I said it's going to take 50 to 100 years. Well, you know, we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> came out to the Great Plains uh, as a small boy and fell in love and have found myself here on the Cheyenne River, western South Dakota. I bought my first cattle in the 70s sometime. I had them for probably 20 years there and I thought, you know, this isn't quite right because I was bringing them food constantly in the wintertime. In the summertime, I was trying to find shelter for them from the sun it seemed like we were really being run by industry, by the chemical industry, by the feed industry. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought something's got, there's got to be a better way than this. About that time, it dawned on me that what really needs to be out on these Great Plains is the in indigenous animals. And so it didn't take me long to figure out that I needed to go to Buffalo. On the Great Plains, with the vast harshness, you need something that's a little bit more sturdy, that doesn't require all of that maintenance. Well, you need something that evolved here. Starting the, the buffalo on grass, finishing the buffalo on grass, harvesting the buffalo on the prairie. We, we don't have then the feedlot concentrations and the waste products from those feedlots. There's just so many sources of contamination and sources of greenhouse gases in the food supply chain that we eliminate by doing things the way the O'Briens are doing it here. Cattle tend to eat the grass right down to the ground where you're not gonna see that with buffalo. And so they kind of maintain their own pasture. The bison are awesome, but it really starts with the land. It's managing it in an appropriate way that keeps the soil and the grasses healthy. So that, that's critical. We're, we're really grass farmers, and bison are one of the, the tools that help manage it. And of course, the meat is just a byproduct of that. Right. Well, this is the Buffalo Nation. We bless the buffalo that's given to us, and the jobs that are given to us by the buffalo. Thank you, Buffalo Nation. Bless our knives, bless our safety. Do this with good thoughts, pure thoughts. Honor the buffalo. The scientists that have been here this week is, to me, an affirmation of, uh, corny as it may seem, what I've felt in my heart for a long time. You know, I've always thought that, that it's too bad that soil is sometimes thought of as synonymous with dirt, because it's not, it's really more like gold. The fact that this stuff is pumping, you know, carbon from where it's doing bad stuff mm -hmm. to where it does good stuff. We're here actually doing the, the sampling of the soil and measured for its carbon level to understand statistically whether there's differences in the different pastures that have been grazed by buffalo. So we've succeeded in doing quadrat number one of... Uno. Uno. 149 more to go. <laughs> what we're hoping is that we can develop bison ranchers on the reservation who have that spiritual and uh, cultural connection to the buffalo so that we're raising them in a manner that is appropriate for our relationship with the buffalo. We have to take a lesson as, as a human civilization and begin recognizing with humility that these plants are far better than anything we've ever conceived of. They sequester, uh, they build organic matter, they you know, create soil help, and the grasslands can be improved greatly by putting bison back on the landscape. And the thing that I, that I try to keep in mind is that 
that in some ways, every species is of equal value. They all have their place. You know, the chemistry, the ecology of the landscape, and the relationship with people can be reinvigorated. So what a spectacular opportunity. Nature loves diversity. Humans are always trying to centralize. We want to commoditize everything. And it's wrong. You have to break that paradigm. There's 60 million acres of weed in this country. Basically, it's all the same. It's been defined by a commodity system. What if you go out of that and, and pull in what could be there and what could be there? Flavors and nutritional value, colors, textures, functionality. All of that's there just for the taking, but you have to go, you have to go in and get it. Most of the grain that's going into the bread you eat, the beer you drink, is grown on huge acreages. Most likely that's only one variety. The more corporate the plant breeding becomes, the less varieties we have available to us and the less genetic diversity. And that's really scary because we're gonna rely more and more heavily on pesticides. So this is WSU Mount Vernon. It's a small version of Washington State University. It's nice just to come in early each day and watch the whole, whole thing unfold. The sun, the weather, the plants. We're kind of in an internal spring here. The students are going to do crosses here. and Basically, you just take pollen from one parent and put it on another. We don't call this genetically modifying. We're just making a hybrid the way that's been done for thousands or tens of thousands of years in nature. We can have these specific goals that were never the goals of breeders in the past because it's always been driven by conventional farming practices and um, large milling industry and large baking industry. We have never specifically bred for organic farmers. So we've never bred for farmers who, instead of using chemical fertilizer, are using organic fertilizer, using compost. Um, we've never done that before. The beauty, I think, of what we do is, is trying to figure out what you can get or what you can produce or what could be there. So one of our main jobs is offering options and alternatives. You can have buckwheat that works in a system like this and has incredible flavors. And then, then in a way you get pissed because you see how restrictive everything was in terms of our food. We call this the Magic Skagit, Magic Skagit Valley, and it truly is a remarkable place. There are over 80 crops of commercial significance grown here on about 75,000 acres due to the maritime climate and the wonderful soil that we have here. Just having PhD students and, and all of this activity at the station is just a very healthy thing. It keeps us all on our toes. Frankly, it's a real privilege to farm here, but it is also a big responsibility because you don't want to be the generation that let it go. Our main goal is to first make what we do work for the farmer. As plant breeders that don't do GMO or genetically modified anything, make a crop that can yield a little more for the farmer and have the right functionality and flavors and nutritional value in the end. Well, in uh, June, we planted about four acres of buckwheat. Uh, the variety is called Koto and it's uh, a, a bit of an experiment. This is a much more viable crop than growing feed barley. It's going for a, for a human food crop as opposed to a feed crop, which typically is very low value. It would be easier if the whole valley was one crop. You know, we just went and did that crop and sold it on contract. But I, I think it's healthier for the farmer to have this diversity. It's healthier for the soil. It's healthier for the community. Buckwheat, we use as sort of a symbol of, of attempting to keep value where it's produced. It's really a nice model of this. Uh, it's a re-decentralization of what we do. 
This is organic full pint barley, uh, just harvested the, yesterday. I run it through a cleaning mill, and then it will go, some of it will go to malting, and uh, some of it will go to an organic distiller. You know, people are making a statement, and they're saying, we appreciate the way you farm, and we're willing to help you along the way to do it. And the bottom line is, you know, if a, if, if 100 years from now, there are viable family farms on this valley floor, and salmon in our rivers like there are now, and ducks and waterfowl and shorebirds and everything that we have here. If, they, if 100 years from now all that still exists, everybody wins. Agriculture revolution is not going to come through technology. It's going to come through, in a lot of cases, the old ways of doing things. The miracle of salmon, uh, where to begin? Uh, salmon are amazing creatures, indicators of the environment, as close to medicine as food gets, uh, and a wonderful resource. They're our identity in the Northwest. They are our buffalo. Uh, the Native Americans in the Northwest survived on salmon. The ocean, on an annual basis, will pump like a, like a heart. And it will push this life nutrient fish up and through our rivers. They fertilize the riparian areas, the trees. They, they feed the wolves, bears, eagles. Each fish that goes into each river is a physical and genetic reflection of the habitat that it evolved in for the last 10,000 years. And they all are unique. I started this fishery in 1992 uh, when I moved to the island, uh, although I've fished commercially all my life since 1973. And it wasn't until uh, 92, when I bought this gear, uh, that I really started to experience something different about fishing. In the past, um, all fisheries were relatively robust. And so you could use gears that caught all species. And now we have some fisheries that aren't doing well and others that are doing really well. And we need to have gears so that a fisherman can catch the targeted fish without hurting the non-targeted fish and release those fish unharmed. If we're gonna have salmon in the future, we need to look for new tools. But in this case, the solution is not a new tool. It's an ancient tool. Out here on uh, Lummi Island, we're looking at uh, what's called reef net fishery. And actually this fishery in slightly different form, but the same similar technique has been used for thousands of years out here by First Nations. It uh, encourages the fish by the observation of what they think may be a reef. Uh, which is actually developed by ropes with small pieces of plastic hanging down from them in the water. The fish comes up, thinks it's hitting a reef, and gets, gets closer to the surface and closer to the surface. Individuals you'll see on these towers will be standing on top of the tower, actually just looking into the water. Well, the whole job uh, starts with spotting the fish. If we don't see them, we can't catch them. Typically, I'm in the headstand and I'm looking out over the water, trying to spot a school. Uh, a lot of the times it's real obvious, you can see the fish plain as day swimming through. Other times it's just a very light color change or, or even just a feeling. When we spot them, there's a big commotion, go, go, go! Or the classic hall is give or hell.
instead of many fisheries where they're caught by their gills, they're just trapped in a purse and they slide them off into a live trap. We haul the fish in, gently roll them in a pocket into our live well, immediately sort any non-targeted or protected species right back into the water to swim. And then the fish we do keep one by one, we'll individually handle, uh, bleed, and immediately put onto slush ice. It is truly selective. It's a passive gear that will allow the fisherman to catch the fish that it knows it's sustainable and release those that are not. This fishery is the most selective fishery that I know of, and we've, I've been doing this for 26 years. I don't know of another fishery that has a smaller footprint than we do. The whole process, being able to target species so uh, tightly and to basically have no bycatch no other fishery can do that. Without reef netting, a lot of these people would not be here. It's not just a job. Uh, people are passionate about our fishery and what we do here. Uh, it matters how we do things, the way we individually handle fish one by one, the respect that we catch salmon with. I think that learning from what we've done in the past um, has really helped us to like figure out that we really do need to be taking care of the salmon and making sure that we are helping them to continue and to grow. We're all doing our part then to, to raise the level, the value, and, and spiritual value too of the salmon. We're providing a model. We're, we're showing that this can work. And every year we'll get a little tighter We'll get, we'll grow a little bit more and, uh, you know, one foot in front of the other. If you go through life not embracing the complexity, then, then to me you're not really trying. It's a bit lazy, right? It's to just accept what's handed to us. And, and there's no, no better example than food. I know Yvonne, he's been out seeing these fisheries for his whole life, and uh, he knows there needs to be a change. You, you, we have, all have a responsibility to leave this land better than we found it. I mean, I feel uh, the earth moving here a little mm -hmm. bit, and I'm so glad to be part of it. These people, these farmers that we're working with, these fishermen, their eyes are wide open. Putting a small group together, all believing in the same thing, all going in one direction, you can't believe what we could accomplish with that. <laughs>